today's um, network world, we are constantly interconnected with different parts of the world. Our increasingly connected lives are linked with the kind of digital devices that we have. I'm very sure most of you have multiple devices. Um, a lot of my research looks at digital inequity, and most people ask me, what does that mean? And it's about unevenness in terms of access to information and communication technology um, between people who have access, the gap between people who have access to these technologies and people who don't necessarily have access. Often the term that is used in this context is what they call the digital divide. However, I find the digital divide a little problematic in terms of its contextualization. Because when we talk about the digital divide, we're talking about haves and have nots. And often we fail to understand that it's not just these dichotomies of people who have and people who do not have. I am um, from Ghana, West Africa, and oftentimes when I introduce myself as Ghanaian, um, the question people ask me is, oh, um, I recently went to this part of Africa, and I assume I know which part of Africa that is. Or they know somebody in Africa, and I assume that because I'm from Africa, I definitely should know those people. <laughs> so I try to remind them that Africa is actually a continent. We have 54 countries, and Ghana is a tiny bit of one of the 54 countries. Um, and the reason why I talk about this is because I am Ghanaian, and I have lived in the United States for the past 10 years. And living in the United States, and also having family back home in Ghana, I go back and forth these different environments. And I've come to realize that when people know that I come from Africa, the first thing they want to say is, how can we help Africa? What can we do? Some people think about different ways in which they can use technology to bring about social change in these different contexts. So a lot of my research focuses on how developing countries, people living in developing countries, especially people living in Africa, really think about ways in which they embed technologies, information and communication technologies in their everyday lives. And throughout my research, there's a tendency for me to see people really having good intentions about how technology can be used to actually address global inequalities. Often there is a tendency that really let's insert technology into their lives and that would bring about change. And so there tends to be a techno-determinism, a very, very much Western ethnocentric approach to addressing global inequalities. So let me come back to this point where I talk about technologies and how often people are using technologies to bring about what they call good. So there's a whole movement that talks about technology for good. You have development agencies, we have governments, we have nonprofits, we have individuals that really think that they can use technologies to address global problems of poverty, of literacy, of health, of education, of governance. Um, and so they look for ways in which they can use technology to bring about these changes and to bring about a difference in the lives of these people. And so often, there's this tendency that it's going to be about really inserting these tools in the lives of the people. So let me give you an example, because there's a perception that the people who live, who are different from us, have different experiences from us. And therefore, the engagement of these people tend to come from a very, what I call, um, stereotypical perspective. A lot of these technology for good projects tend to target Africa. They believe that if we can give Africa computers, it would bring a change in their lives. So let me give you an example, and I think in this particular delivery, what I want the takeaway is that it's not just about technology, but it's actually about people. It's about context, and understanding that our experiences here sometimes really um, cover our understanding of other people's experiences. So let me give you an example of my experience here um, coming to the United States. So as a graduate student, I arrived in the United States and I felt I had a mobile phone when I was in Ghana, so it was going to be pretty easy for me to have access to mobile technology. And so I went to a shop and I had a rude awakening. Okay, to get mobile connectivity in the United States, First, I had to have credit. 
I just arrived. Where am I going to get credit? Okay. Second, if I didn't have credit, I had to put two months down payment. $150 for a graduate student, that was a hefty sum. After that, I had to sign a two-year contract to be pinned to one service provider, whether I like the service or not. And what really bothered me, I think, big time, was the fact that I had to pay for not just my outgoing calls, but my incoming calls on my 1,500 meager units, uh, minutes per month. That, for me, didn't really make sense. And why do I say that? Because in Ghana, it was pretty easy for me to get access. All I had to do was to go to a mobile shop or to a mobile kiosk and just purchase a phone. I actually could purchase a phone, prepaid units, just sitting in traffic. And I had mobile connectivity. So this is where the disconnect is. On one hand, the United States are supposed to be the haves. And my experience in the United States was such that I was without mobile connectivity for one week. While in Ghana, it was very easy to have that mobile connectivity. So I think there's sometimes a disconnect in our understanding of people's engagement with digital technology, especially in developing countries and also in places like Africa. About 10 years ago, um, a group in MIT decided that was such a great idea to think about how we can actually help people in poor communities. The idea was that, you know what, I think education is a thing. We should try and get laptops into the hands of young people, children, the ages of 6 to 12, and that if we gave them these laptops, we would actually address global inequity. And so these laptops were provided, um, and I'm going to show, the next video is going to show one of the campaigns that went with it. It was a um, Give One, Get One campaign that was in 2007 launched so that people could help and promote this particular project. So this project was targeted at different parts of the world, but it was also targeted at African countries. My name is Zimi. I'm seven years old. I come from a place you've never heard of. A country you cannot pronounce. A continent you'd rather forget. Your problem is access to education. With education, we will solve our own problems. To the person who gave me this XO laptop, thank you. You have changed my world. So we are asked to give a laptop and change the world. The idea is that by inserting this technology into the lives of these children, they would be able to transform their social realities and everything will be fine. But the truth is, this project failed on a number of levels. It failed to achieve its own set goals. We had wanted to have a laptop given to every child in a developing country. Um, and why did it fail? It failed because it failed to understand the context in which these technologies will be used. These technologies would be appropriated. What is the construction? It, it, it failed because it really had this conception of childhood, of education, that was based on a Western lens, on a very American-centric perspective as to how people engage with digital technology. And so, when we go to some um, places, you'd find out that they bought a number of these laptops. In Ghana, we bought about 10,000 of these laptops and put them in pilot schools. Um, and as of now, most of them were broken. Um, it failed to understand that a lot of these kids had work to do when they left school, and that even when they took the laptops, they really couldn't do much with it. It failed to integrate teachers as core, so if the teachers didn't have laptops, how were they going to help the kids learn? Um, so it failed on a, mud, an, an, on a number of levels, but partly because 
it really comes from this mindset that we can prescribe for people what is good for them. And often, when we have these prescriptive viewpoints, a lot of these projects that attack technology for good really fail to achieve their own goals. It's important for us to know that when we talk about technology and we want to use technology for social change, we have to understand that it is the people that facilitate the change and not just the technology that we insert in their lives. So my argument is that when we're thinking about using technology to address global problems of poverty, of literacy, of health, of environment, of governance, we really need to understand how the people are using technology in the first place. We, we need to break down our perception, sometimes the monolithic stereotypes that we have about the people that we want to effect change in their lives. There are so many people that when they're thinking about Africa, they see Africa as really this place of want, as passive, as not really having any agency. But that is not true. If we go to Africa today, there are exciting things happening. In fact, we see a lot of movement in terms of digital engagement. Increasingly, we see that mobile phones are really having an exponential growth in Africa. Even though commonly used as for mobile voice, um, people normally call family and friends, arrange um, meetings, as well as manage their livelihoods over the mobile phones. But increasingly, we're seeing an estimation of growth in terms of data, mobile data, moving from uh, in two, between 2013 and 2019 being 20 times, a 20 times growth. And why is that? Because increasingly, the barriers to having mo mobile connectivity are coming down. In the US, we see that there are barriers, but we sometimes don't realize that we are, there are barriers because we do not feel those barriers, we tend to be among maybe the elites. But there are barriers to having um, connectivity here. But increasingly, in a lot of these developing countries, these barriers are down. It's very easy for people to have access to mobile phones. And increasingly, as they are having content that is relevant to them, they are using the internet. Now mobile phone access and internet access is all converged in the mobile device. And so you are having people use some tech apps like WhatsApp to really integrate and connect with other people. So my core message here is that when thinking about really how do we use technology for good, we really, especially in the context of Africa, we really need to focus on the idea that Africans are co-collaborative in the process of effecting change. Because there's often this mindset that just because we are in the West, we know better. We know what is good. We tend to be prescriptive. And so it's important for us to bear that in mind. My work really deals with how market women use mobile phones to um, manage their livelihoods. And most of the time I engage with these women, they really talk about the ways in which they use mobile technology. And their mobile technology use is very much embedded in their cultural practices and their realities. Context does matter. So th um, when I talked to some of my market women, I realized that a lot of them had multiple phones. One of my interviewers said she had three phones. I guess from a Western lens, we kind of wonder, why would a poor person have three phones? For what? Well, they have three phones for very good reasons. It's about quality of service. There are multiple phone lines, but really people want to have connectivity. They want to be reached. Connectivity matters to them. But most of the time, the services are not reliable. So since it's very easy to access any um, service provider, they have as many service providers as they can, and therefore be able to be reached. Because being connected is important. It has implications for whether people would have to spend two or three days to go to the village to just deliver a message that they can deliver over the phone. Having connectivity matters in terms of really deciding for this woman where she's gonna get her, her product, or connecting with her consumers and say, hey, I've got new products, you guys can come by. Just a phone call allows them to be in multiple places at the same time, and these have implications. It also has implications for how they are connecting with each other, especially in communal societies. And so yes, 
multiple devices are important. And as a result, if they don't have multiple phones, they have phones with multiple SIMs. And so you have multiple SIMs that enable people to switch between carriers so that they use carriers that are most effective. So it's important for us to know that just as we live in the West, we might have certain mindsets, but it's we need to understand that people living in other places that we seek to help also engage in very innovative ways with digital technologies. And so if we seek to help them, first we have to be able to understand that we cannot think for them. We cannot prescribe what is good for them because at the local level, they know what is good for them. And so it's important to engage these places as co-partners, as collaborators in using technology for good. It is also important to understand the cultural context in which technologies are embedded for use. We really need to understand that technologies are inherently part of their culture and they are used in very different ways from how we use them. So we have to address issues relating to culture and context. Additionally, we have to understand that they are appropriating technology in ways that is meaningful to them. This is a billboard that targets market women and says the market on your mobile phone. It provides the latest market prices where you can find new buyers and sellers. So much as these are good tools, these are local tools whereby there are collaboration between people in the West and people in, in these developing countries, they become very powerful tools and help people to know how to appropriate these technologies in meaningful ways. Another important tool is really the idea of money transfer and remittances. These are central parts because in a lot of African countries, it's important for people to move money from one place to the other, from urban areas to rural areas. And being able to do that through the mobile phone is increasingly becoming a very important thing. This is M-Pesa, which is based in Kenya, that allows for money transfer. And this was in 2007. It was way there before the iPhone 6 came with the Apple Pay. And we find that also happening even in Ghana where we have money, mobile money, that allows people to be able to make payments as well as transfer money to different parts of the country. Because these innovations are local and these innovations make sense to the people because in their lives, a lot of these people do not have banks. Some of them do not have a means of saving money and so the mobile phones becomes a way of moving money from one place to the other. So it's important that even as we're thinking about how do we use technology for good, we move away from technocentric ideas and think towards human-centered approaches. We need to also engage developing countries, especially the continent of Africa, in a way that we give them agency because they are very enterprising and very innovative ways in which they are engaging these technologies. We need to first understand that technology is about people and that it is people that will facilitate social change. And so even as we think about technology for good, we have to come to a place where we are thinking about how do we partner with these people, with these different contexts, and to ensure that even as we bridge the digital divide or digital inequities, they make sense. And that is not just inserting technology or transferring technology into the lives of people, but it really is about how the people themselves make sense of technology, use technology in a way that is meaningful to them. And perhaps by making these connections, by understanding local context, we might use technology for some good. Thank you. Thank you.